All right, everybody, Adam back with another episode of the Bow Hunter Chronicles podcast. And today uh, we're going to talk broadheads. And uh, I think broadheads can be like some of the most polarizing uh, things in archery uh, beyond, I, I guess, camo pattern. Um, you know, everybody's got their brand of bow. Everybody's got, you know, some stand saddle whatever but when it comes to broadheads kind of like the the business end of the arrow so to speak it seems like you can have you know a hundred good experiences and then one bad season two and then those broadheads are garbage and now you're looking <laughs> for the next um you know the second coming so uh, we're going to talk here with uh, John Lusk, uh, Lusk Archery Adventures, and I can't think of a guy who can talk broadheads more um, with more experience than than this guy. So how are you doing today, John? Hey, I'm doing great, Adam. Thanks so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to this for a while. So for guys who maybe have just stumbled upon your channel and they think of you as like the broadhead guy, um, what is your hunting history? Like, how long have you been hunting? And like, talk about like how you were brought into the sport. Yeah, that's a good question. I, my, my dad was a big bow hunter. My mom and dad were both competitive archers and he was a, in the military, three-star, became a three-star admiral in the Coast Guard actually. But so I grew up and his passion on the side was archery, trophies all over our house. And we're always spending time at the range since I was five years old, have a little bitty bow and I, you know, I have pictures of me shooting it out there and stuff like that. Then as I got older, you know, got better bows and started going into the woods. We lived in Louisiana at one point, like my middle school and high school, and we'd go hog hunting and deer hunting in Honey Island Swamp in Slidell, Louisiana. And we, we just loved bow hunting. So I grew up doing that till about college. And then I got really busy with my job. I work as a pastor. I was in campus ministry. Falls hunting season was my busiest time on campus. Then we went overseas and lived in Asia for a number of years in Thailand. And it's like illegal and it's considered a sin to hunt because they believe in reincarnation and you might be shooting your great great grandmother or something like that. That's now a deer. And so I didn't do it for so long, like six years when we were over there. Then we came back to the States and I've been making up for lost time ever since then. So I've been, uh, you know, I did it a lot as a kid. And then I came back when I was what, like in my, in my mid thirties and now I'm 58. And so I've been doing it whole hog for the last 20 plus years as well. So uh, if guys are watching the video or they've seen any of your videos from your like studio there, um, lots of animals on the wall. Uh, so how many different species of animals have you hunted and, and harvested successfully with a bow? Yeah, that's a good question. Shoot, I should have prepared that. I even keep uh, track of that. You know, I'm engineer and so everything's like research for me. So I, uh, I love, I'm a numbers guy. My wife teases me let me let me look here i'm seeing if i can i can dig it up i got a lot of different species let's see 2022 okay yeah here it is species taken with a bow okay i've got 23 big game species harvested i shot a, a 24th i shot a wolf in alberta and i didn't recover it and i was really bummed i wanted that wolf eight african 15 north american um uh, 11 different Pope and young, six different species of Pope and young. So yeah, quite a few different animals. And in my later years, like in the last five years or so, I've started taking more adventure hunts. And so I've gotten a, a bit more savings and stuff to do that with. And I take maybe one or two big adventure hunts a year. So that's increased the species quite a bit in the last five years. So uh, just real quick, we were talking about in our, I've got a, a Patreon and in, in, in the, in the group there, they were talking about uh, wolf hunting, got a guy out in Montana and uh, they were talking about wolf hunting, trapping, and then, you know, with a bow. And I can only think of one other like person that I know personally who took a shot at a wolf with a bow. And that was, uh, they were on an elk hunt in Idaho and sitting in a, blow down Colin and had a wolf come in and it just kind of was a swing around type shot, but was the wolf, the target species and how did you go about that? Or was it just the opportunity? 
Um, I guess it was kind of both. It was, uh, you know, when you go to Alberta and you get a hunting license, they throw in two wolf tags free, just kind of like, hey, all right, if you see one, get one. The outfitter, I was hunting over a mineral lick, a natural mineral lick, early season. It was moose and uh, whitetail. And he said, however, he'd been seeing some feral horses. They have feral horses there. He'd been seeing some feral horses coming in on the trail camera. Well, it was like mid morning, 830 in the morning, first morning, the feral horses came in, including one little foal in their midst. There's like three big ones and one little one. And they stopped and just their attention was riveted right toward me. And then I looked down, it looked like their eyes were looking down and there was three wolves just red. They patterned them. And the, the wolves were just waiting at the mineral lake. It was it was cool. And then the wolves just pushed, like ran out after them. The horses ran out in the field. And then there was an alpha wolf. They'd set up an ambush that came from the other side and pinned them in. And they're running around my tree and, and my bow, like, like full drops going around the tree. And then one peeled off and I pasted them. I thought, I, I mean, you went, Phew. and I mean, it was a pass through blood everywhere. I went and watched him lie down. But then the big one was on the other side, just going, oh, for an hour and 50 minutes. I videoed. I still have the video. And then he just he kept getting up. And I'm like, stay down, man. And he kept getting up. And I didn't want to get down from my tree. It was scary. But then I thought, OK, I, I can see the swath of blood. But I waited a couple hours and went out there. And he was gone. I, I looked forever. I was bummed. I really wanted a wolf. So I, you know, I was ready in case there was a wolf. But I, it was kind of happenstance. I really wasn't expecting that there'd be a wolf. And the outfitter had never heard of the wolves attacking the feral horses. He'd always wondered if they did. But that confirmed that they did. So. Um... Man, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but I think this is kind of like a perfect segue. Um, one of the questions that I had was, you know, you, you're you kind of like this. I would say that, that the way that you were brought to my attention was the guy that does all the broadhead testing, right? Mm. And so I, what I wanted to know was like in the early days, like in your first couple hunts, you know, what broadheads were you using? And was there an event or something that, led you to be like oh man i gotta try some more of these different broadheads because this one didn't work and and how the segue goes at, at this point is like what broadhead did you shoot the wolf with and, and kind of what happened yeah that's a good question so yeah I, I grew up in in trad bow hunting and so my dad would shoot like zwickies bear you know some of the classic uh, that were around back in the day then this is 50 plus years ago but then when I started, kind of restarted again, when I was like in my mid thirties, that was just, I was on a really tight budget. I went to Walmart and picked up some Allens and I shot, I remember shooting, I shot a coyote with an Allen, like and I got him. I mean, it, it didn't even pass through, but I mean, he just came up on me. I stood up and, and he, he bit the arrow, he bit the arrow in half. It was kind of cool, but the broadhead got all mangled. Then I shot a, a doe with one and the broadhead got mangled. I'm like, man, these things, you know, I, I thought they cost a lot. It was like $6 a piece, you know, but, but they, you know, they were junk. And, and so then that kind of got me thinking, well, you know, all broadheads aren't created equal. So, and I, I have an engineering degree as well as a theology degree, but, you know, engineering wise, I'm kind of analyzing design. I started getting into it a little bit. And I was on archery talk. I'd love to read about different broadheads and stuff like that in archery talk. But then I won just out of the blue. I won this broadhead from Bishop Archery. They had a free giveaway and one broadhead cost like $120, I think it was. And I won it. And so then the guy said, I started talking to the guy, what makes this one so good? And, and he, he said, well, when you get it, you know, I had a small YouTube channel just with hunts, just a few little hog hunts, deer hunts, things like that, just self-filmed. And and then he said, hey, maybe you want to do a test with the broadhead and post something on your channel. I'm like, all right. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was just thinking, what can I shoot it into? I shot it into a pumpkin. I, I shot it into like a, a steel flat bar. I shot it into a frozen hog shoulder. Like I was just thinking, what else can I blow up? You know, what else can I shoot? And I posted the video and it got some real traction on, on, uh, on Archery Talk and other places that I posted it. And so then I thought, well, let me test some others. And I had a few others lying around, like I think an NAP kill zone, a grave digger. I had a few others. So I 
started kind of testing them through different mediums. And, and then people would give me broadheads, friends, hey, why don't you test this one? I'm like, all right. And then I noticed that YouTube was not promoting the, uh, the hunting videos as much as they were promoting the, the, the testing, the gear testing videos and reading their policies. I feared one day they might not have hunting at all on their videos, but, but, and I can't do, I can only do so many hunts, right? But, but gear testing, I can do that all the time. And they're always probably going to allow that. So I started doing more and more broadhead testing. And then my process got more and more and more refined over the years. And that's what's led me to today. And so I, I think the, and we talked about it a little bit prior to the podcast, but, you know, you can only do so much testing that isn't on an animal, right? Because of angles, because of this. And so, you know, I, I know from, you know, just forums, you know, Facebook, anecdotal, even reading the comments, like, well, what good does shooting it into cinder block do? You know, what does that do on a, on a deer or, a, you know, I you know, I shoot this bow so I can shoot faster and, uh, you know, then planing and all these other factors that don't come into um, the test. So from a, a, a hunting standpoint, how did that, that transition? Cause it's one thing to um, make videos and be like, okay, these are neat broad heads. Um, you know, things that come to mind are like the toxic broadhead or something, you know, where, you could do all the tests in the world and they can create this strange wound channel and do all this stuff. But, you know, when you're going through hair and then fat and then bone and meat, um, you know, from a hunting standpoint, how have you transitioned, you know, from the day you got the Bishop to, to today, are you going out and, you know, let's say that you kill six, eight animals a year, are you doing it with different broadheads or are you saying, well, I'm, I've been a thunderhead guy since day one. I'll test all these broadheads, but thunderheads my go-to. Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, and by the way, that wolf was with an Exodus and they had just come out and I, um, I hit them a little high, a little far back. And so I, I must have clipped the lungs, but it must have been high lung. And so it just, it wasn't enough. I, man, nothing replaces shot placement. E even though you may think you had the perfect shot, but even within that, you may have had the perfect shot, but a deflated lung a, a, versus an inflated lung, a certain movement, their own body type and strength. Like there's just more variables than are controllable. And like you said, in a hunting situation, there's, there's so many variables. There's infinite number of variables the movement the the angle of of the the geometry of a bone the the angle of impact the the density of that particular animal's bones and muscle structure there's there's no way that you can come up with any kind of formulaic testing with those many variables so what my testing does as an engineer is i try to create repeatable consistent tests to where every broadhead i test I'm testing in the same ways. And I test for flight. I test for sharpness, edge retention, for penetration, for cut size, and for durability. Those are the five things. And each one is weighed on a 20-point scale with a maximum of 100 points. And so that th every test I do has to be under like a extremely similar conditions in exact same mediums. So I try to replicate as much as I can what one may experience in a hunting situation. But more importantly than that, I'm putting each of the broadheads through the same test. And then the viewer can decide whether that test is important to them or not. Like say for durability. For durability, I test by shooting it into MDF, half-inch MDF, three times. So it's just uh, you know medium density fiberboard. And I use that instead of plywood because it's consistent. You used to use plywood, it has the grains. You hit a knot, you hit a grain a certain way, you're gonna get a flawed test. And so I, I don't do that, it has to be consistent. When well, then I shoot it through a 22 gauge steel plate two times. And then I shoot it, if it makes it there, it's like a knockout round. If it makes it through the MDF, makes it through the 22 gauge steel plate, then I shoot one shot into a cinder block. It's a zero penetration test, which is actually a really good test of the structural integrity of a head. And so the thought being, 
if a broadhead can do well in MDF, in the steel plate, a really hard impact that tests that, that blade strength, and then into a zero penetration test like the concrete, then man, it stands a lot better chance of holding up to an animal. Doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect on an animal, but it's gonna be a lot better than a broadhead that doesn't do those things well in the testing. So every head I do, I put through those tests or the penetration, I have the same set test for penetration. I have one that's a combined medium. It has a, a two one third layers of, of a rubber foam mat. That's like to simulate hide. And then it has a, a half inch of MDF sandwiched between that and then clear ballistics FBI grade gel that's after that. And so it's kind of a kind of a similarity of hide, bone, and muscle tissue. It's not perfect, no test is. But I test through that. Then I also do a penetration test through layered cardboard, extremely consistent. I buy these boxes in the pack. I keep them in the pack. I have these giant C clamps that hold them in place in four places. I make them as consistent as possible and shoot the head into that and see how many layers it penetrates. So all of my tests are as consistent as I know how to make them. And so what you come out with is not a perfect broadhead, but you come out with how well did it do in sharpness and edge retention? How well did it do in penetration? How well did it do in flight? How well did it do in an angled shot? How well did it do in durability? And it, by and large, if a head tests really well in those areas, then it's going to test well in the field. And I take I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 20 animals a year. Like I, I get to do a lot of hunting. Now I'm in Texas. I think I'm going to get to do a lot more hunting, a lot more hog hunting and hunting 365. You know, if I didn't have another job, I'd do even more. But, but you know, I, I'm going to shoot a lot more animals, God willing, and be able to test them. And I love to test different heads. Like in a, a year like last year, I, I'd have to look in my notes and I do record it in all my notes, but I think I used... I don't know, I think I took like 15 animals or something and probably used 10 different broadheads. So I have my faves and, you know, if I'm going after something that really matters, I'm using my favorites. But my favorites are the ones that have tested the best in my testing. And I've never been disappointed. Like that, I, personally, I think it's going to kind of be impossible to disappoint, although anything can happen in the way. I, I shouldn't say it. Anything can happen. There's going to be things that happen. But by and large, if it tests well through this, the rigors of my testing, it's going to do well in the field. Now, is it necessary to shoot a cinder block and hold up to a cinder block to take an animal? Absolutely not. But is there a better chance that broadhead is going to do well on an animal if it does hold up to a cinder block than one who doesn't? Absolutely. So it's all just about stacking the odds and seeing how the broadheads perform in these repeatable similar uniform conditional tests. So from like an engineering standpoint, when you're um, using these broad heads in the field, so I'm, I'm to assume that you're taking in your tests, not any excessive measures for like touching up the blades or anything like that. You're probably taking them out of the package and using that as your baseline. As you go to hunt animals, are you doing anything above and beyond uh, to increase the the sharpness or uh, because it seems like you're a very analytical guy, uh, checking all the grain weights on these and making sure uh, that everything is, you know, basically blueprinted um, from from that standpoint? It's a good question. And the answer, it's funny, it, it might be a little surprising, but it's it's yes and no. Okay, say like, okay, I, I love sharpening my broadheads, touching up the broadheads. That's a fun thing for me. And I mean, I like getting them really sharp. But if you have a crappy steel and you're getting them extra sharp, it, it can feel really sharp. And, you know, I do a test for out of the box sharpness. That's not when I sharpen it. That's just out of the box, just so people see, here's what it is. But the head's largely that test really well out of the box it's like tin foil it can be really sharp but it's not going to hold up and so a really sharp edge means a really thin edge and by and large and it means a really weak edge if you're using just ordinary steel and so there's an initial sharpness that that comes when it first impacts something which is usually your quiver but then you know it impacts the hide and man that sharpness is dropped considerably 
when impacting hide, like you take a knife and you cut, you know, if you cut like the back of an animal and you go against the, you know, you cut through the hide, that knife is already dull. Well, a broadhead going 300 feet per second hitting that hide, man, before it even touches tissue, it's dulled considerably. So edge retention, it to me, it's even more important than edge sharpness. People, I do test for sharpness. I have a sharpness tester. It's very uniform, as uniform as I can make it. But I do think sharpness is overrated. I will say that, and people get really mad at me at that. I, for, as far as penetration is concerned, I can take a broadhead, and I've done it, take a two blade, get it as sharp as I can, and then take that same two blade, a you know, different broadhead in the pack, and dull it with a file to where it's butter knife dull, and shoot them into different mediums, and they penetrate almost identically. There's a lot more pushing and, and penetration by push than there is by cut, than people realize. So they do these tests where they say, how many pounds of force does it take to push this broadhead through an animal? That's a useless test because what happens at 300 feet per second is completely different than what happens when you're pushing in slow motion. It's like jump into a pool versus, you know, off the side versus jump into a pool at, at 300 feet. You're gonna feel the water in a very different way. Like dynamics is different than statics and so, stuff that happens at a fast, at a you know high rate of speed like that, the dynamics of penetration are very different. So I do think sometimes sharpness can be overrated. So there are certain heads that I go sharp enough. Like if it if it's like on my scale, like uh, you know 200 to 300 even, out of the box sharpness, that's grams of force that it, grams of pressure it takes to cut through this copolymer wire in the sharpness tester that I have. Then many people go, oh, that's so dull sharp enough to consistently get pass throughs and great blood trail. So I do just because, you know, if I have the time, I'm going on a hunt, man, I want, I want the odds stacked in my favor. I'll extra fine tune them to shoot a deer or something like that. A lot of times I just, I, I take what I get, but, but those are with the broadheads that have already tested well. And I know they have good edge retention. I know they use high quality steel. I know they are pretty sharp already, you know, um, can I get them sharper? Yeah. And, you know, so I, I, I'm not at, same with weight. Like I can weigh a broadhead and it's like, oh, this is three grains heavier than this one. Ooh, I'm not going to shoot that. And I hear people say it all the time. I can put 125 grain head on, on my bow or a hundred grain. I see no difference out to 40 yards in within my margin of error. I mean, a group like that, no difference. So three grains, four grains, a, a drop of water, if it's raining, we'll put a, you know, the water will put way more grains on than the difference between three and five. So I'm, I'm, I think people get over analytical. I love analytics, but only so far as they are, you know, they have validity in a hunting situation as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's good for me to hear anyways, because I'm a, and I think most of our listeners, um, I would say fall more on the, like the hunting uh, standpoint the you know we're very um uh we're trying to be as ethical as possible obviously we try to know our gear we shoot our bows a lot uh but i i mean i'm the guy that takes my bow out of the case puts it in the case and it's in and out of the case all season long i don't bring it in and dust it off and make sure that it's nice you know the like we talked about a little bit earlier like like the two of the arrow broadheads with the carbon steel you know they'll get like rusted up or you know then it's like okay well i know that i gotta go do something or i gotta get a different head um but there are guys that are meticulous about that and i it's interesting to for you uh to say that coming from like a trad background because i think that those guys focus on that so much and the way that it was put to me and maybe you can maybe debunk this or 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 you know validate it like to a degree is that the sharper the broadhead you know when you get inside well i guess more more over like the duller the broadhead it can some of the soft tissues push it out of the way rather than slice it as it's as it's going through um and so that's why people are hyper focused on like the scary scary sharp broadheads and and again I think more over from like the traditional community and maybe that that's carrying over now into, into the compound shooter. Yeah. Well, you know, there very well could be validity of that. I've read those articles too, about a clean cut 
you know, surgeons have said, you know, is more difficult to clot, you know, because there's, there's fewer edges to, you know, cling to each other and stuff like that. I get it. Um, and I do like my, broad, don't get me wrong. I like my broadhead sharp and I do, if I shoot them into a target, I resharpen them before I go in the field. I want them as sharp as, as I can get them. I'm just saying, I think sometimes people can overstate it. However, in trad shooting, you're talking about much slower speeds. And so in those slower speeds, like I was saying with, if you just push it, you're going to see an incredible difference between broadheads that this one takes two pounds of force to penetrate. This one takes 20 pounds of force to penetrate. So that's at that speed. Well, between that and 300 feet per second, there, there's, you know, some, I don't think it's necessarily linear, but there's some sort of correlation and the slower it is, the more important that is to penetration. That gets into like the three to one ratio. Trad shooters have long touted and some still tout the, the, the validity of the, the length to width ratio. Three to one is the maximum penetration, penetrating design because the thought is that that's, you know, how like it's a, it's the wedge effect, you know, that you have the three to one, it's like a, like a ramp, a wheelchair ramp. It's the coefficient you know, the, the, it, it's the best angle to incline, say like a wheelchair ramp is three to one and it maximizes your, your energy. But it's really silly to be honest to do that with a broadhead because you're not, you're not wedging, you're, you're cutting. And so the three to one is, it's, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're, you're not prying something apart, you're cutting through it. And so that, that, physics law doesn't apply to cutting. And I've found that, especially at higher speeds, uh, a shorter broadhead with less surface area to create friction on a medium, and it depends on the medium too, will largely penetrate more effectively than a longer, narrower one because it has so much more surface area. And it will fly better for the same reason. It has less surface area, less friction in flight, less planing, um, it's just going to fly more like a field point, the less surface area, the smaller, the shorter that the broadhead is. But again, these things, you know, it, 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 it doesn't mean it, it, it's always going to penetrate better. It's not going to penetrate. Well, they're just kind of general principles. So uh, from, from that standpoint, let's, let's take a look at like some of the, 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 the questions that people want to know. Um, and, and we'll go uh, from like a, a fixed blade standpoint, just to start um, in your testing, like benefits of uh, single bevel versus dual bevel, especially with a, from a compound shooter standpoint, and then with a bleeder blade does on a single bevel, does it make sense? Does it affect the twist? Does, you know, are we, are we talking any, any sort of, uh, benefits more one over the other. Yeah, this is, you know, this is a hot debate and I have a number of video tests on my channel of single bevel versus double bevel within the same broadhead, same weight design and so forth. And there's benefits to both. The, 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 the image that I read in certain person's reports that have become really popular is that as a single bevel, as it penetrates, it's rotating. It's rotating so much. It's like it's like twisting spaghetti around a fork with the innards, and you're twisting that tissue and cutting it so much. So then I was curious, like, well, how much does it really rotate? And if it rotates a certain amount, how much extra tissue is being cut? Because I even said in some of my earlier videos, and not too long ago, that as it rotates, well, it's cutting so much more tissue because it's spinning around like that. So my brother is a quantum physics professor uh, out at a pretty good university. And I asked him to come up with a formula to see how much more cut is there in a single bevel versus a double bevel if it rotates X degrees. And if it rotates the maximum of any single bevel that I've ever tested, then it ends up being like it cuts like 0.003 inches or percent greater amount of tissue. It's like, in other words, almost inconsequential in terms of cutting more tissue like that. That was a shocker. For many single bevel advocates, that's a shocker. However, there is a benefit of single bevel that when it, especially when it's, it's in flight, 
you're getting a lot of spin from the, the fletching, especially if you use a helical. That arrow is spinning like a rifle bullet to keep it on track, right? That's why you have fletching. And so it's, it's hitting. And when it first hits, you're getting all the spin of the arrow and you're getting the extra rotation caused by penetration, which is very minimal, but you're getting a little bit as it penetrates. And so I've had animals I've shot with a single bevel that the entrance hole, it's literally a round hole. It's like, it's not a slit, it's a round hole. Now, by the time it's exiting, it's, it's smaller and it's slower. It's not rotating nearly as much. And it's typically just a slit coming out. But with a double bevel, I've never had a double bevel make a round hole as it penetrates. So there is something to that. There's, there's something there. And then when it comes to breaching bone, the, the, again, there's different thoughts. I shot a Cape Buffalo with a single bevel. And the single bevel, the, the thought is as it impacts a bone, it has a just a little bit, but a bit of pry to it, a bit of rotation, and that puts a little torque, and it splits the bone apart versus kind of cutting straight through it. And 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 the thought is, if it splits it apart, then the whole arrow is going to be able to slide through that hole more effectively. It's going to penetrate better. That's the theory. And when I shot a K buffalo, man, I looked at that rib, and it split the rib long ways like i mean it was split imagine that that hurt okay and that animal couldn't move as effectively it just took one arrow to bring it down but maybe it would have split with that thick of a of a double bevel and i just i didn't shoot it with a double bevel and and maybe it would have penetrated just as much and if in in theory if you just had two you know single bevel versus double bevel next to each other in certain mediums a double bevel is going to get there faster because it's not using any energy to to rotate around but then the other theory is yeah but the single bevel creates a little torque in a bone and then that can make a little bit wider hole and the arrow can go through and penetrate better i you know both have their advantages i hunt with both honestly bleeders so hype do they work do they better worse like yeah this is a good question so when i'm thinking of a broadhead like i'm thinking lethality like when it comes to hunting one of the challenges with a broadhead if i back up just a little bit is is people reading an article or hearing a podcast like this and they'll hear oh this is a good one and they go use it for them but their setup is totally different or they're hunting an animal that i would never use that broadhead for so each, in my opinion, like each person's personal setup, their poundage, their draw length, the weight of their arrow, and the shot distance, and the, and the size of the animal that they're hunting, all that goes into deciding which broadhead is right for them. But I want a broadhead that's going to hit its target, that's going to fly good. First and foremost, it has to fly really well. And then I want a broadhead that's going to give me a great chance at two holes. You can't always get that, but I want two holes. If not a clean pass through, at least it's going to poke out the other side because two holes are going to bleed better than one and maybe be a bit more lethal, certainly be a better blood trail by and large. And then I want a broadhead that's going to cut as much tissue and specifically as wide of a cut because I find it's not just about the total tissue cut, though that helps, but about the width of the cut. If you have a, a little a broadhead, let's say it has six blades, and you go, man, this has like two and a half inches of cut, but it's only one inch, something like that. You go, that's a lot of tissue it's cutting. That's better than two blades cutting one inch of tissue. But it'd be better and more lethal if it had like the, the two and a half inches in diameter. Because a wider cut, as the, as the animal moves, tends to stretch and become even wider. Whereas a smaller cut, even with multi-blades, it typically kind of stays that size. So that's just something to think about. But if I can get a pass through and I can get it with a one inch cut or a one and a half inch cut, or I can cut two inches of tissue or one inch of tissue, and both are going to be pass throughs. Well, I want to cut the most tissue I can while still getting a pass through. I remember shooting, I used to shoot a, a little wasp boss bullet back in the day. And man, I'm zipping through every white tail and I'm getting a tiny little hole, but I'm zipping through. And I thought, I'm wasting my, my, my momentum. Momentum, you know, in mass times velocity, that's your penetrating force. I'm wasting it. So I started using a bigger broadhead, a bigger cut, because I want to cut more tissue as I'm passing through. And then if I'm not getting pass throughs, I go, oh, got to back up. I need a little bit smaller because I want to get those two holes. So great flight, two holes cut as much tissue as I can. I want it to be as, to retain its sharpness as best it can for the cutting effect like you were talking about, 
I haven't been able to quantify it, but I understand a sharper broadhead is going to cut better. When I'm playing around with broadheads, like an iron wheel, I have cut myself unlimited times when I'm messing around with an iron wheel. I rarely cut myself. Iron wheel, I will bleed. There will be blood. Sharpness does, it, it can really make a difference like that. But then when it comes to, then durability, I want it to keep that maximum cut size and penetrate well without deforming, without bending without breaking as as best i can so all those factors determine which broadhead i use so when you go to bleeders when you ask about bleeders some people say oh bleeders are a waste i i i don't see how they can be a waste I, you know you go okay i can have a one inch cut two blade if i'm going to pass through with a one inch cut two blade okay or i can add a half inch of a bleeder to that one and a half inch or one inch cut now i'm getting a one and a half inch hole as it goes through, I'm cutting that much more tissue and I'm still getting a pass through. Why would I not want to use a bleeder? Now, if that impeded the penetration to the point that I'm not getting a pass through anymore, well, then I, you know, I would get rid of the bleeder. But if the bleeder is still passing through, the more tissue I cut, the more lethal that broadhead's going to be. That bleeder, like say you just had that bleeder, say it's a half inch. Would you want a half inch of anything to cut through your body? No, you go, how about you could have zero cut through you or a half inch? I go, I'll pick zero. So that half inch makes a difference in you. It would make a difference in an animal. If I had a, a choice of a one inch broadhead going through me or a one and a half inch, I'll pick the one inch. I don't want a bigger hole. So bleeders do make a difference unless they impede penetration to the point that you're not getting enough penetration to be lethal. And so then that, I mean, uh, the the next logical thing that kind of stands to reason there is, well, then why not just shoot a four blade? Because you're going to have that much more. And maybe that's for uh, the lack of penetration, especially on a slower bow, like a trad bow or something like that, or arrow flight. And one of the yeah. things that they talk about, and I don't know, I think now with, you know, bow speeds, tuning, uh, you know, different fletchings and, and all that stuff's been around forever. But that my, my father-in-law would always talk about four blades and planing, right? So that was always the big, big thing. Like no matter the, the, the four blades, like, oh, well, how does it shoot at, you know, distance? Because I don't, I don't know if it was a big thing in the eighties and nineties that, that four blades plane like crazy, uh, but like the tooth of the arrows and, you know, there's other four blade broadheads out there that, you know, shoot just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like say slick trick tooth of the arrow, one inch. I mean, the, that's it. To, in my testing, that's one of, if not the most accurate forgiving broadhead there is and slick trick as well is right up there. Um, so four blades can, they can fly really well if they're short, but it's all about surface area. The more surface area you have, it's the same as having larger fletching. The more fletching you have, then the more drag you're creating. And that in fletching case, it keeps it spinning more. And so it's gonna keep it on track more. But in a broadhead sense, you're gonna get more of a rudder action, the bigger it is. And if it's, it, what happens with planing is, if there's any imperfections in your arrow setup, your spine, your your tune, anything that's causing the arrow to leave your bow a little less than perfect, then the greater the surface area on the front of that arrow, the broadhead, it's going to catch that and it's going to veer it off course. But the, the less surface area on the front of the arrow, then the more forgiving that bow is going to be. Now, with a very well-tuned bow, even if there's a lot of surface area and a big old foreblade, four blade, if it's made well, it's probably still going to fly very well, but it will expose any imperfections in your, in your spine, in your tune, as well as in your form. And so the less surface area, the more forgiving the flight. So yeah, you could say, well, then why not just use four blade? Well, like I said, I'd rather shoot an animal with a one and a half inch cut two blade than maybe like a, a 0.8 inch four blade. Like I, I like a wider cut if I can get it because it's going to make a bit more of a, a better, a bit better blood trail because it stretches that whole stretches tends to, as an animal moves. 
So let's talk a little bit. And, you know, obviously this is you have some data. Um, but, you know, somewhat anecdotal, right? Because I'm going to kind of ask like opinion style. But like, what's the most underrated broadhead that doesn't get enough uh, love, I guess? Oh, that's a good question. You know, Adam, that's a that's a hard one for me to answer because I, you know, I, 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 it's hard to say what people like. You know, I will say that whoever spends the most on marketing has the best following, the greatest following. Like if you look at Rage, I mean, I think I heard some night one time it's like ninety five percent of their budget is going into marketing. That's a business decision. That doesn't mean because you're seeing it in all the pat the magazines and you're getting the celebrity endorsements, it doesn't mean that it's the best broadhead out there, but it does probably spend the most on advertising, certainly of mechanicals. And so, you know, that that would be one that I would say certainly can be lethal. I've taken animals with it. I wouldn't want to get shot with one, but that's overrated. And so, you know, it's all about dollars and marketing. And I think we can get deceived by those celebrity endorsements, a magazine ad in those top magazines, like $50,000, $50,000 for a magazine ad like that can, that's a lot. Okay. And, you know, does that mean it's, it's 50,000 times better? No, but it's going to sell a lot more. Like there's a reason they're willing to put it in the magazine. So I see overrated as more of a problem than underrated. However, okay. Yeah. Maybe I can answer it. Like I've gone on Amazon and I found some broadheads that I go, hey, let me test this thing. Okay. Made in China. D power. Okay. I found some D power three blades that I'll put up against almost any head on the market. And they cost like three to five dollars a piece. I mean, they have a solid steel three blade that that thing is, I mean, it, it's as good or better than the vast majority of solid one piece broadheads made they they have a three blade one and a half inch broadhead cut that man is just killer and performed really well i would say d power not all of their stuff but a lot of their stuff is underrated because you think ah chinese junk but man they're using a lot of the same factories that are used to make heads that cost you know five times as much they just do it you know and you know who wants to support china you know i understand it but you ask for what's you know underrated I think that's one that comes to mind as being underrated. Yeah, and looking, mechanicals can be underrated. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I would just say I'm I'm looking up that, and I I looked at that last night, and I've got your uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet right here. And those heads, I had, I mean, I went and found the video and and looked at everything, um, and I was like a dollar sixty seven a head. I was like, what are these heads? And that was the D Power. And it's got a nine score and an eighty six out of a hundred um, on on your on your rating there. So I, I had to look at those, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, that that's serious." So when you say that mechanicals uh, can be underrated, right? One thing I did this year, so I, I've had so uh, my. Uh, the basis of this podcast is that I am the world's worst bow hunter. So I'm bringing <laughs> on people here to uh, help me along with the listener. And so through that journey, I've made about every poor broadhead decision um, known to man. And the the one that comes to mind uh, always and, uh, you know, shot placement is always going to be key, but I was shooting the, rage extremes um out of a 60 pound bow with the unknown arrow weight or anything you know it was just off the shelf what you'd expect um and i shot the biggest deer i possibly the biggest deer that i've ever seen in the woods um mm -hmm. and probably the biggest deer that i'll ever harvest it was um just we green scored it uh just over 150 uh mm -hmm. down in ohio but I shot it in the neck and didn't get a pass through. And the recovery was just by happenstance, basically. Um, but knowing now, 
you know, that was probably, you're supposed to shoot a high kinetic energy bow, you know, your, your, your high poundage speed, um, too big, you know, the arrow, the, the broadhead was destroyed. Uh, I shot a doe with those same broadheads, bent feral, you know, all of these things. Um, you, you mentioned the nap kill zones. Um, uh, we were hunting and uh, a buddy didn't want to spend the money on the rages. Nap kill zones were supposed to be better with the slip cam, uh, all that. Shoots this doe at 20 yards, doesn't get a pass through. She goes 500 yards. You know, all these things can like sour you on broadheads, you know, killed tons of deer with um, thunderheads, you know, because that's the the arrow of or the, the broadhead of the time when I was when I was coming up. And then you look at, you know, we've got a, a very uh, successful, one of our Patreons, great hunter, and he's still using like the Spitfires. But in the early days of mechanicals, when it was rubber band opening and, you know, you'd get uh, reports of uh, like uh, my, my uncle would shoot those, you know, the cheap, probably the Spitfire knockoffs or, or whatever, and had them bounce out a deer. Um, just because of things that had happened, you know, early deploying, everything like that. Um, this year I watched some of your videos and, uh, Joe miles is also doing some, like, um, like removing the industry and just doing some, some testing side by side by side, same, same tests. Um, and, you know, he's a guy who's been all over TV. He's a outfitter guide all of the the, the things um and, he, and and you guys both kind of came to the the sever broadhead kind of came to the same conclusion that these are you know pretty robust head um and i that's what i shot this year and you know, shot a turkey with them shot shot a deer with them and and, and had a, a pretty good experience uh but i'm still you know i still kind of go back to like the less likely failure of a, a, you know, no mechanical parts, like, so fixed blade, you know, I don't know. So from a, from an underrated standpoint, like where do, where in your testing, like where do mechanical heads fail and what, what do you look for in like a quality uh, mechanical head beyond marketing? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a really good question. And in broadhead design, anything out there can kill. I just, I, I always keep saying that, like, I wouldn't want to get shot with any broadhead. And so the, to, to the, your initial thing, and you didn't really say this, but you referenced it early, the anecdotal evidence, you know, I shot my biggest buck ever, not you. Okay. That was a kind of a bad uh, example, but sometimes people, I shot the best year ever with this broadhead. And so in their mind, that's the best broadhead ever. And, and I get it, you know, you caught your biggest bass ever with this lure and now jitterbug's your favorite for life. You know, I've, I've done those kind of things too. And, but, but that's what I try in my channel to parse through and let's get away from the marketing. Let's get away from the anecdotal evidence. What is the hardcore evidence, at least in these 10 tests, you know, if people want to do other tests, they can do other tests, but I want to, I want to do that. So I put mechanicals through the same rigors that I do fixed blades and they, they, they have their trade-offs. Everything in broadhead design is a trade-off. Mechanicals will fly better. There's no question about it, especially ones that the less exposed surface area, the less exposed blade, the better it's gonna fly. So you reference Sever, man, they got two little tiny little wing butts sticking out. That thing flies sometimes better than a field point, I find, because the, their specs are just so high. You could take a Rage Extreme that's a hybrid and it, man it has you know a one inch in the front or something like that then it's got the even the mechanical blades stick out quite a bit that's got more surface area exposed than some fixed blades so it's not just all mechanicals fly better but mechanicals the less surface area exposed the better it's going to fly so for people who man accuracy matters the most to them maybe that maybe they can shoot really good at the range like i shoot really good at a range and under ideal conditions, but a quick shot at a, at a moving buck, you know, that's in during the rut. And I got to weave a little hole through you know, over this stick and through these twigs. 
or I'm nervous. You know, I, I mean, you go from zero adrenaline, you're like falling asleep to like you're amped up, you know, like you took an adrenaline shot in the heart. And I mean, you know, you're, you're a little nervous or your bow isn't really super well tuned or they didn't get the practice they needed. I shouldn't do that. But a mechanical will fly really well by and large. That, and you're going to get a really big cut with it. So you could get a to get a, a a fixed blade to be forgiven in flight. Typically, in most setups, it's going to be a really small cut. So you go, okay, do I want a really small cut fixed blade that I'm guaranteed to get that, or a really good flying with a huge hole in a mechanical? So everything is a trade off. And when all is said and done, you got to educate yourself and make a choice based on the animal, based on your skill, based on your setup which is going to give you the best chance at getting hitting the animal in the right spot and getting two holes and keeping its form as it goes through holding its edge as it goes through and that's going to give you the best chance at, at killing an animal now with mechanicals there's over the top front deploy mechanicals like you referenced the spitfire earlier or like a grim reaper they they penetrate and the blades peel back from the front so there's good to those that like say in a turkey you had a turkey in the in the tail quills man that's hard to penetrate and there there's stories of people using a a big broadhead that bounces off those but if you use a front deploying broadhead it's going to penetrate then it's going to open up really big and be very lethal however if you shoot say an elk with one or or a deer you're going to get a little hole in the beginning by and large and then maybe if you don't get a pass through then you might not get good blood. It may be, you know, incredible internal blood, but if you don't get a pass through and you have one little hole, there's less chance you're gonna get a good blood trail than if you use a rear deploying broadhead where they hit and the, the blades deploy from the rear. I don't know how to do it. So you're getting at least a really big full-size entrance hole. You may not get a pass through because it's having to cut through a lot of hide to make that first cut, but you're guaranteed to at least get one big hole. And I've had incredible blood trails from big two blades like the Sever, like you're referencing, even though I didn't get a pass through some of the time, some, most of the time I did, but sometimes I didn't. But man, that first hole was so big. The damage was so great. I got an incredible blood trail. So everything, even within mechanicals, is a trade off like that rear deploying or front deploying. Which are you going to go with? I like the Sever personally because it's the most durable of any mechanical head I've tested by far. I've shot one broadhead into cinder block three times, three times, and it's still going strong. I could have kept going. I shot, I had an elk scapula, I had several elk scapula. I shot one through an elk scapula, I think it was like 11 times, even including the really thick bony part. And this is a dried scapula. Boom, an elk scapula, 11 times before a little piece of the blade broke off or a piece of the tip broke off. Man, I mean, it doesn't mean they're perfect, but I've never had a mechanical even remotely as durable as that. And mechanicals are not known to be, endur be endurable. So people go, yeah, they fly good. They get a big cut, but, you know, they can fall apart. So if you can find a mechanical that doesn't fall apart, mm, that's something worth looking at. That's what I, I like about Sever personally. But there's others that are really good as well like that. So, and none uh, are perfect. So, so keeping like, um, I mean, I guess if you need to use an example, you can but like keeping brands or specific broad heads out of it just attributes right maybe things to avoid in your the the so uh, in your testing um broad heads that perform better do they have a thicker blade uh on a mechanical do they have better uh tolerances i guess you know you pick up a broadhead and you can hear it rattle uh things things like that uh, you know feral uh length material um those sorts of things just because one of the hard things now in today's day and age is there is so much uh chinese product from amazon that you're going to order them and get them tomorrow instead of going to the shop and looking at them you're believing what you hear on a podcast as it's the best broadhead and there's so much even with sever uh like direct to consumer where you can't necessarily just pick one up and and try it 
and you might not know anybody that shoots them around your your local neighborhood so if you're looking at say specs of a broadhead are there things that you can look at through all of your testing and say yeah i don't think that one's gonna make the cut that's a good question there are and then sometimes i get surprised with to be honest with which is why i have my tests and i mean the best thing i can say to come up with those principles is to encourage people to watch the videos and not just of broadheads they're interested in but try to look what are the trends you see but even for me i've tested i, I want to say well over 200 may, maybe 250 different broadheads in the last several years alone like hundreds of different heads and i still get surprised there's some that i go oh this is going to fall apart and i shoot it i'm like god oh. <laughs> like that thing held together and i found that sometimes like okay like say when it comes to durability there's a few factors the material is it steel is it aluminum if it's steel what kind of steel if it you know within a kind of steel is it machined or is it uh, metal injection molded um, like that, those all make a difference. Is it one piece or is it composite, like put together with little set screws? Or if it's aluminum, is it 7075 or 6061? One is like way stronger than the other one. So there's the materials, but then there's the geometric design. And you can take the geometric design determines the 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 strength, sometimes even more than the material. You could take an aluminum head that has a really stout ferrule. And that can do way better, be way more durable than an all steel broadhead with a thinner vented ferrule. So the, the short, stout geometric design, the shorter, the stouter, the stronger, the, the better the quality of the material, whether steel or aluminum, the stronger, the, the better the hardening process. You could take the same steel, you can have S7, you go, it's S7 tool steel. But even within that, there's different hardening processes, and some will have a different rock well, meaning they're different hardness, or they'll have a different um, Sharpie score, which a, a Sharpie V-notch is like its resistance to impact. And, you know, like if, if they drop like a, a certain weight on the steel and how big that V is, that notch, it's, it's like the steel's resistance to impact that can vary within the same steel so it can get so complicated you can't just say steel's better than aluminum people say that but you go what kind of steel are you talking about what kind of geographic geometric design are you talking about what kind of hardening process are you talking about and because it's not always that clear so it can sound to a listener like well what the heck you know because it's so confusing but that's why i do the channel to just go through let me just go through hundreds i just dropped what like three hundred dollars last night ordering I have a ton of heads to just jumpstart this year. I just moved to Texas. I need to get back in the game and doing some testing. I'm getting settled. And so, you know, I have hundreds of dollars of, of the tests. So people don't have to. And it's not like my tests are perfect, but you're going to see what happens when it when it hits a hard surface like MDF. You're going to see how sharp it is out of the package. And you're going to see how it flies. And you're going to, you know, there's a lot of data, data points that you're going to get. That's all I can really provide is data points. And you determine how important are they to you, but I'm not going to have a bias. And I, I used to not have the data points. I used to kind of go, well, I think this one, da, da, da. and there's still some subjectivity as I analyze the results, but I do quantified results and, and this numerical algorithm, the scale to come up with a composite score, which isn't perfect, but it's the best I can think of. And it took a long time to come up with it. But that's just to help a person cut through all the advertising, all the anecdotal stories on this side or that. And let's see how these heads compare. But you can have a head in my scale that you know does really good. It's a high 80 score. But that may be it did really good because it had a super big cut but it wasn't very durable. And so you can reach, you know, the max of 20 points within each of my five categories, totaling to a hundred in different ways. And again, that's the purpose of it. Like, let's figure out, you know, everything's a trade-off. If I'm looking for flight, okay, let's look at these. Well, I'm looking for flight and penetration. We'll look at these. Well, I'm looking for something that's pretty good in all of them. Okay, we'll look at these. And I have all the scores there in every video so people can read in the description below the video, they can see how those scores fare and know how a broadhead does so that if it's a direct to consumer, like you're saying, you don't have to buy it. To, you can look and I do an in-depth analysis. Here's how it works. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. Here's the drawbacks. 
here's the dings, here's the, you know, the good things. And, and then here's how it performed under these, you know, systematic repeatable conditions. So I'm going to ask you some questions about some, like you said, different broadheads for different animals. And uh, mm. we can wrap this up here pretty quickly, but uh, on the, like average guy. So we're going to say, you know, if you were to say 60 to 70 pound draw weight, probably a 28 inch draw, you know, you're, if you're at, if you're at a bow shop, those are the ones that you're ordering. Right. Um, and a guy is going to hunt, we'll go whitetail elk, bear, and Turkey. What are your broad heads for each choice? No, oh, gosh. I just, you mean like what are my favorites for each choice? Well, what would you recommend? Or... Like if you were going hunting and you, mm-hmm. it was, it, and it was going to be, you know, the, the, the once in a lifetime. So you drew your Iowa tag, um, you're going to Alberta or you're going for, you're going uh, to Alaska for a brown bear. And now you're hunting New Mexico. You finally got your tag uh, on a bull of a lifetime. And this is the the last turkey you're down in um, Mexico for that strange oscillated turkey to round out your slam. And you, you're you going to get one opportunity. What broadheads are you mm-hmm. shooting? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd say, let me say this in general, because, I mean, there's, even if my favorites, I'll have... I could list off 10 that I could take like, okay, I'm going on a brown bear hunt in Alaska this May. At least it's planned, you know, God willing, you never know, but, but it's all set, locked and loaded, all paid for. And I mean, I go to sleep and I'm thinking, well, which broadhead am I going to take? Like, I mean, I just get so anal about these things. And the truth is there's a lot of them that can work, but I just want the perfect one, you know, and Jenny Hendricks was looking for the perfect note that would bring world peace. You know, I'm looking for the perfect broadhead that'll kill every animal and it. It doesn't really exist like that, but I'd say, say for Turkey, I want the biggest mechanical cut I can get, period. Give me the biggest cut, the bigger, the better. I've used like a dead ringer. We get like three blade, 3.8 inches of cut or whatever, and they just go down. And I've used a big game three fixed blade for them. They Because the big game three has a one and eight inch diameter three blade for a fixed blade broadhead. I shot a turkey with that down. But I want big cut for a turkey, probably a mechanical for flying purposes. For, for an elk, I want a moose. So I got maximum durability. And it depends on how I'm hunting the elk. If I'm hunting where I think there could be a shot of 100 yards, I want to make sure that it's going to be a, 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 a fixed blade, but that's going to really fly well and really be durable. Because, man, elk are tough, and it's going to have to penetrate well. So it may be something like a tooth of the arrow, or not in tooth of the arrow. It may be, I could use tooth of the arrow, but it may be like an iron wheel, like an iron wheel with bleeders. Um, that That would be a good choice. Or well, an exodus would be a good choice, but I want a, a decent size cut, but good penetration, great flight, great durability on a big animal like that. If I use a mechanical, it would probably be like a sever 1.5. A mechanical, I'd go smaller. The bigger the animal, the smaller the cut, because you're getting better penetration like that. So, you know, in a big animal like that, I want smaller cut, but I want great flight and great durability and great penetration. If it's like a deer, man, pretty much anything can work with a whitetail, but it depends on where you live. You know, if you're up north, you're in Iowa, you're in Michigan, you're Wisconsin, where there's like some huge body deer, or you're hunting uh, muleys, you know, less, or here's the 300 pounder plus or something like that, then I still will use a a mechanical. I could use a, like a short, a smaller mechanical, maybe like a a 1.5 inch sever or a 1.7 inch afflictor or something like that. There's a number of other really good heads, but I'm going to go for a little bit smaller mechanical or a really good size, decent fixed blade, like, like an Exodus, like a tooth of the arrow XL. Um, and, and there's many others that just, you know, I, I could list a lot. Cayuga Gen 2 pilot cut. This, these just come to mind where I'm getting a decent size cut because whitetail aren't that hard to kill. Bear, I want a big, I, I've taken them with fixed blade, but like say it's a black bear, I want a big mechanical because they're pretty easy to penetrate, stay away from the shoulder, you hit them in the middle of the middle and they're, they, they have, their hair absorbs a lot of blood. So the bigger the hole, the better. And I mean, any kind of a big quality 
mechanical will do really well. Grizzly, like I was saying, you know, I want something that's going to fly good. My shots are going to be kind of far, but I want to fix, I'm taking fixed blade. They got to go through a lot of hair to get to that grizzly. And man, you know, I don't want to get all mangled up in a mechanical personally, though I'm sure a mechanical could work, but for a grizzly, I, I'm probably going to take a really good quality uh, fixed blade, decent size cut because they get in the thick stuff and you can't follow the blood trail, you're in trouble. So I want a, a good size cut, maybe like an iron wheel wide or maybe uh, like big game uh, they have a big game too and big game is coming out with a little bit smaller one right around that time that might be a winner um you know so i i i just think the bigger the animal i want durability and penetration and then the longer the shots i want something that's going to be super forgiving in flight the smaller the animal probably a big fixed blade or a really big mechanical and so when you talk about that perfect broadhead that's just going to kill everything perfectly, the one that you lay in bed at night or you're looking longingly out the window daydreaming about the the Lusk archery do-it-all broadhead, like what does that look like in your head? It, yeah, and it, it it's hard. You know, any broadhead can kill any animal in theory. I'd say for all round broadheads, Say for a fixed blade, hard to beat an Exodus. It just is. I mean, one and a half inch or one and a quarter inches of cut, three blades. So 1.875 inches of total cut, extremely durable. 0. 0.040 inch thick blades, thick blades, replace, replaceable blades. So those who don't want to mess with sharpening can just buy new ones or they're easy to sharpen, especially with a stay sharp guide. You can get that thing so incredibly sharp with those but i mean in exodus i've taken so many animals with them they're they're bigger than most fixed blade but they still fly really well because they're short and very tight specs so i i love those slick tricks are always really good in that regard for a mechanical all around hard to beat a sever 1.5 it's just i've taken so many animals with them and in all my testing i just they they have a unique feature that they have patented and nobody can copy it, that their blades lock open, but then when they when they lock, they they have a shock absorbing thing to where if the blades hit, you know, steel, they hit concrete, they're really hard to break because they overlap so hard that they can get stuck overlapping like the ends, but that's a built-in shock absorber to keep them from breaking and bending. It's it's genius. But but that's what's really unique about those. And so you know, that's probably for a mechanical, my go-to, I shot a zebra at 82 yards with one super windy, you know, terrible conditions, but those things fly and they're tough. So those might be like two of my very favorite all rounds for a fixed and a mechanical, at least off the top of my head. And so as you're, uh, you know, headed to your brown bear hunt, like what is your bow setup, bow setup, arrows, you know? what what are you running and you know that that may vary a little bit with the broadhead if i go with a heavier broadhead but but you know my bow setup it's basically going to be the same bow setup that i would use for elk that i used for moose use for whitetail use for hogs use for turkey it's i use right now i'm using a, a bowtech cp28 it's set at 72 pounds it's like maxed out 72 pounds and but that's just with a 27 inch draw my total arrow weight um, is typically about 440, 450 grains. But if I use, like, and that's with a 125 grain head, if I go up to a 200 grain head, then, you know, it's going to be that much heavier, you know, up a little over 500 grains. And I, my, my arrows are cut to about 25 and three quarter inches. So they're really stiff and they're like a, a 250 spine and they're short. So I can get, I have play to use like a hundred grain broadhead up to like a 250 grain broadhead and I can still get decent flight out of it like that. So that's what I'm going to use for that. I'll use my same setup. The shots there are going to be probably about 40 yards, 35, 40 yards. And so, you know, I, I want a, a good size fixed blade that's going to be durable, penetrate well, and make a big hole. That That's what I'm leaning for for that. Okay. Well, John, I really appreciate you coming on here and, uh, you know, talking broadheads and, and, and kind of sharing your story and, and really kind of like, I don't know, maybe clarifying some things 
uh, for guys like, you know, cause y- you've got a ton of videos on your channel, but I, and I'm sure you'd want everybody to go watch all 200 of the different <laughs> broadheads sure. uh, or, or whatever. Um, but you know, sometimes it all just kind of falls back into the, into the mix and you, there's so much to, you know, absorb, um, you're like, Oh, that's the one. And then if you've ever fallen into a YouTube rabbit hole, then you're like, Oh, well, these ones are, Oh, well, what about these ones? What about these ones? And then my favorite guy talks about these ones. So I really do appreciate you coming on here and just kind of, uh, talking through that. Now, where can people follow along and what can they expect for you from you coming up this year? Yeah, that's a good question. So you can follow me on YouTube, Lusk Archery Adventures, any broadhead you, you're you interested in. If you go to YouTube and search Lusk and the name of the broadhead, if I've tested it, it'll pop up. So Lusk, Razorback, Lusk, Magnus, you know, whatever. It, if I haven't tested it, it won't come up. And I'm hoping to do more and more like that. This year, I'm going to be continuing the same. Oh, you can also follow me on Instagram, Lusk Archery Adventures. Facebook, Lusk Archery Adventures as well. And I'm on uh, Archery Talk and I'm Bowhunter64 on Archery Talk there without the E in Bowhunter. Um, and then, because uh, I did that before I had the channel. And then uh, this year I'm going to continue the same testing. Usually each year I, I tweak something in my test process, but I couldn't figure out something to improve at least right now. So I'm going to continue the same scoring process and testing process that I did for 2022. I may retest some heads because they make some improvements or maybe, you know, they devolve. Maybe they've gotten worse. They sold to a conglomerate or something. Let's see if the quality went down. But I've already got a bunch of heads lined up. I mean, I've got, I don't know, like five that I just was taking pictures with and I just ordered another I don't know, eight or so last night. I've got a small game uh, head test coming up, a battle of like six different small game heads. Somebody sent me a bunch of them, so I've never done that before. I'm going to do that test. And also in the test, I'm going to be trying to shoot them through some fun things, you know, just every once in a while. I've done it a little bit, but I'll do it more this year just to spice it up. Let's shoot through a can of beer or something like that and just, just for fun. And I'll do a lot more hog hunts, God willing, this year. And be able to, uh, and I, I do try to do that. Anything that tests well for me, I try to use it in the field and show how it performs in a real life situation as well. Because I don't want to just do it in the lab. You know, I want to do it in the field also. So be looking for a, a bunch more hunts coming up as well. And, you know, you referenced this earlier, Adam, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to share this because I know it can come across as a bias. I, I do have discount codes that I offer For the companies that are direct to consumer or primarily direct to consumer, they're direct to consumer, you know, they they cut out the middleman. And I I love to support the local bow shop. And I always try to get attached to a local bow shop. And I'll do that here. I test their bows and put in plugs because nothing replaces the knowledge of the local bow shop. But some people are on really tight budgets and a direct to consumer allows you largely to get a really good high quality at a lower price. And if something tests extremely well for me, and only if it tests really well, then I ask the company, hey, would you give me a discount code? I've turned companies down that have asked me to, to use a discount. I'm like, you know, thank you very much. And not at this point. And so if it tests well, a discount code where people will save five bucks or 15% or something like that. And then I'm upfront about it. I, I do get a little residual Uh, from the commission of those sales and that just helps offset the cost of the channel like I said drop a few hundred bucks on a on on broadheads man like (laughs) this stuff costs so much people don't realize I mean all the materials and everything that I use and then my time it takes a lot of time to be doing those things it's hard to do it and sign away from my family and friends although I enjoy doing it but it's also a labor of love like you know and so um but but what I don't do is I'm not sponsored by any broadhead company people want to sponsor me I go I won't I'm sponsored by a, a sharpener a stay sharp guide so every video says includes paid advertising that's not for the broadheads no broadhead pays me to test their head but they, they, that, that's for the Stay Sharp Guide, and YouTube requires me to say that. They are a cash sponsor. They give me a chunk every year to just help fund my channel, and it doesn't even hit the total cost, but it, it certainly helps. So I, you know, I try to give a, a savings to people if they want to buy it, but I hunt with and test many heads and recommend many heads that I, I have no affiliate marketing plan with either. I, I just want to be objective. 
Okay. I really appreciate that too. And I think, you know, that, that laid it out uh, pretty well. So uh, looking forward to following along. And like I said, thanks a lot for, for coming on here and, and spending some time with me this morning. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate it. Respect what you're doing too. Props to you helping people be better bow hunters. I really appreciate it. Yeah. That's all we can do because we need the help. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. We do. It's a challenge. <laughs>